6.5 Growth and Decay. This section is primarily concerned with the equation dy dt equals ky, where k is a constant. And let's say y is a function of a variable t. If you want to imagine that as time, then y of t could be thought to be an amount of something over time. So think of y of t, for instance, being the amount of, let's say, organic material in a container over time, or at various times according to what the function says. So if that's the case, what does this equation say about what's happening to that material in the container? Well, the left side of the equation is the rate of change of the amount of material with respect to time. The right side of the equation is just a constant multiple of y, which is just the amount of material. So when you put those two together, what this equation says is that the rate of change of the amount of material with respect to time is proportional to the amount of material. And in our example of the organic material in a container, that should make sense. The organic material provides the fuel for growth. The rate of growth should be larger if there is more material. It shouldn't be as fast if there's less material. So basically that's what this equation says. And if that makes sense to you, then you could see this equation would probably be an equation that would describe lots of different kinds of growth and lots of natural situations. And so this is, let's call it the differential equation for exponential growth. Or in other situations decay, which we'll talk about that in a while. Now, why am I saying that it's an equation that models exponential, so-called exponential growth? Okay, to see that, let's take another look at the equation. So dy dt equals ky. Let's divide both sides of that equation by y, which would give us 1 over y dy dt equals k. Let's integrate both sides of that equation. Now if we're going to integrate both sides, we have to integrate both sides with respect to the same variable. So I'm going to integrate with respect to t. Okay, and if you notice, uh, if I use what I know about differentials, I know that this integral on the left will be the integral of 1 over y dy equals the integral of the constant k with respect to t. Okay, what's that integral going to yield on the left? Well, we know now that the integral of 1 over y with respect to y is ln of absolute value of y. What's the right side? It's the integral of a constant, which should just be that constant times our variable, so kt plus c. Now, this process that we just went through of solving this differential equation, and of course I'm calling that a differential equation because it contains that derivative dy dt, the process I used in manipulating this to get rid of the dy dt is an important process. I'll do it again here in the lecture. But make sure you understand this process I'm using in this proof. Okay, we're not done yet because the goal is to try and figure out what the function y is. And I still don't have that yet because I haven't isolated for y. I still have an ln attached to that y on the left side of the equation. So let's keep going.
I know I can raise e to both sides of this equation, and since the two sides are equal, raising e to both sides gets me two things that are equal. What happens when I raise e to the ln of something? I get the something because I know the exponential function and the natural log function are inverses. Okay, what's the other side? Well, I could write that as e to the kt times e to the c. I know that absolute value on the y means that on the right side of the equation, there could be a plus or a minus. So let's say that right side is plus or minus e to the c, e to the kt. Now, I'm going to abuse the notation here a little bit. That c is an arbitrary constant of integration, right? It came from that c we got when we integrated. If c is an arbitrary constant, then e to the c is an arbitrary constant. And if I put a plus or minus in front of it, that entire thing is one big arbitrary constant. Now, I really should call it something different than C because I've already used C here. But uh, I'm just going to relabel that entire arbitrary constant as a C. If you don't like that, let's call it a B or something. But I'm going to be lazy and say that y is now equal to an arbitrary constant times e to the kt. And this equation is the solution to our differential equation that we started with. That is, if I'm in a situation where the rate of change of something is proportional to how much of that something there is, the equation that describes that quantity is this y equals c e to the kt. So it's a natural exponential function with some k factor in the exponent and some constant multiple in front. Now, suppose we knew that y of 0 was y sub 0. So suppose when t is 0, I know what the amount is that's being modeled by this function, and I'm calling that y sub 0. Then, of course, when I come back to this equation, if I use y equals c e to the kt, then we're saying y would be y 0. I don't know what k is. But when am I getting this y0 for a y value? It's when t is 0. So I'm going to put t equals 0 right here. Not the color I meant to use. But what does that give us? y sub 0 equals c e to the 0. And I know e to the 0 is 1. That means that unknown c is just y sub 0. Okay, what would I call that y sub 0 from other places we've seen that kind of notation before? I would call it the initial value or the initial amount. So that means our final solution for this differential equation is y equals y sub 0 e to the kt. And that is our working formula. Now, if you go back to the differential equation for a minute, assuming y is being thought of as an amount of something, so I'm pretending that y is not negative. Uh, the k, though, the constant could be positive or negative. So if I think about what's happening when k is positive or when k is negative, well, again, if this y is an amount of something, so that means y is being thought of as a positive number. Then I can think about how to interpret this equation if k is positive or negative.
well, if k is positive and y is positive, then that means, of course, that dy dt is positive, which means I would be in an increasing situation. That is, y would be increasing. If k was negative and y is positive, then that means dy dt is negative, which means I'm in a decreasing situation. Okay, so that means when I look at this formula, now I know one more thing. I know that k, the sign of that k, determines whether I'm increasing or whether I'm decreasing. Okay, in the case when k is positive, we'll call that an exponential growth function. In the case where k is negative, we'll say that's exponential decay. Okay, now let's connect this back to what you talked about in college algebra. So in college algebra, when you talked about exponential growth and decay, the first thing you talked about was discrete exponential growth or decay. And what we meant what that by that was you had some initial amount and you wanted to increase it by let's say r percent. So of course if I start with an initial amount of y0 and I increase that amount by r percent then at the end of that time period I'm going to have y sub 0 times 1 plus r. If I took this amount and increased it again over a second time period then I would take the amount I had at the beginning of that second time period, which is y0 times 1 plus r, and I would multiply it by that growth factor of 1 plus r again, which would give me y sub 0 times 1 plus r squared. In general, you should recall that if I were to do this over n time periods, the amount I'd have at the end of those n time periods would be the initial amount times that growth factor of 1 plus r raised to an exponent of n, where n is how many periods I've allowed this growth to occur. All right, so the formula you may recall from college algebra is y equals y sub 0 times 1 plus r to the, let's say, t, where t is normally thought of as, as something measured in years, but it could be any other time denomination, months, weeks, seconds, hours, and so on. Okay, so what I mean when I say discrete is I mean there is a percent growth rate, but it happens over discrete intervals of time, whether it's years, months, weeks, hours, seconds, and so forth. All right, now, the next thing you looked at in college algebra, and by the way, I should mention before we go on, you should also recall that if I change that 1 plus r to a 1 minus r, this is now a discrete decay function. Okay, for example, if I said something was decaying by 20% per year, okay, if something decays by 20%, how much is left? 80%. That's because if I started out with an initial amount of y sub 0, I would need to multiply it by the decay factor 1 minus 0 0.20. And basically, what is that? It's taking 100% of y0 and taking away 20% of y0. Okay, that would be y0 times 0.8. But I will just use exponentiation to repeat that for as many time periods as I want this decay to compound. So if I put a 5 there, it means I repeat this process 5 years or 5 periods. All right, now, if all that's coming back to you, then the next thing you might remember is looking at the compound interest formula. And this is a useful formula to review just for its own on its own merits, but there's a, another reason for us to look at us look at this because it will take us back to this 
exponential function we've talked about up here. So if you recall, the formula that you talked about probably looked something like this. Uh, they may have used an n instead of a k, but regardless, the, the formula would have had that structure. Uh, this is where the p would have been present value, or maybe principal. That would be the initial amount of money if I was putting money into an account. a would be the final amount. Uh, by the way, in some books, instead of using an a, they might use F for future value. That's more like what you'd see in a finance book. Okay, what's the R? That's a stated annual rate. Okay, now the important part. What's that K? The K is the compounding frequency. And this is just a system that was devised by bankers a long time ago. And it works like this. If I say R is a stated annual rate of, let's say, 12%, and I tell you that your investment or your interest is going to be compounded, let's say, monthly, okay, that means what? You're going to receive a return on your money, not at the end of the year, but at the end of each month. So if this was the end of month one, the end of month two, the end of month three, and so on, then what we're saying is if we put an initial amount in at the beginning of the first time period, so at time zero, how much am I going to have right here at the end of time one? Well, from what we talked about up here, it should be the initial amount times one plus the rate of growth for that period. And the way banking works, if I'm compounding at a stated annual rate of 12%, but I'm compounding monthly, it means I'm simply going to take that annual rate and divide it by the number of periods that I'm dividing the year into. And if I'm doing that monthly, that would be 12. Okay, that means down here, I'm not going to put 12% because that's not what monthly compounding means. It means I'm going to take that annual rate of 12% and divide it up equally into 12 equal percentages. So what this should look like is 12% divided by 12. And I would raise that to 1. Okay, and that would get me the growth at the end of one period. Okay, now if you're looking at my exponent up here, that doesn't quite look what I wrote look like what I wrote down there with the one, but think about what that exponent says. If that t is in years and that k in our example is 12, then if I did this for one year, what would kt equal? It would equal 12. If I did this for two years, that exponent up there would be 12 times 2, which would be 24, which means I would be doing p times 1 plus 0.12 over 12 to the 24, which makes sense. If I was doing this for 24 months, that would be 24 periods of discrete growth at 1% per period. And if you're remembering all this, that's the way compound interest works. Now, there's a couple problems in your homework over compound interest, so it's useful to review this. But the real reason we want to look at this, if we think about this formula one more time, Okay, now we're not, we're not going to talk about it here because this isn't college algebra or a finance class, but I'll point out to you that for a given interest rate, the more often you compound, the better the return you'll have at the end of a year. That is, if I had two investments that were otherwise equal for all other factors, except I was compounding one of them more frequently than the other. So let's say I invested $1,000 in two accounts. Let's say it was 6% annual rate for both accounts. Uh, 
but let's say one of the accounts is compounded once a month. Let's say the other one is compounded weekly. The one that's compounded weekly, which would be k equals 52, is going to have a slightly better return at the end of the year. The more often I do that discrete growth throughout the year, the more my overall return at the end of the year will be. So what I'm saying there is larger k yields larger growth. Okay, now, what I'd really like to know for this function is what happens when I take the limit as k goes to infinity. Okay, how would I interpret that if I, if I took that limit as k goes to infinity? If k is the compounding frequency, then I'm thinking about k getting bigger and bigger. So if k is 1, we're doing it annually. If k is 2, we're doing it every 6 months. If k is 4, we're doing it every 3 months, quarterly. If k is 6, we're doing it every 2 months. We're doing it monthly. We're doing it weekly. We're doing it daily, assuming 365 days. And from there, we could subdivide the year into denominations as small as we wanted. The question is, what happens if I keep driving that denomination smaller and smaller and smaller, so more of them filling up the year? Okay, to figure that out, let's do a little algebra here. Let's let x equal r over k. I'm just going to do a little substitution. Of course, that's the same thing as saying r equals xk. Nothing fancy there. So that says that a is equal to p times 1 plus. Now, if I'm looking at my formula, my formula says r over k. I've called that x. And then what goes in the exponent in my formula? It's kt. Okay, what's k? Well, either one of these lines will tell me that k is equal to r over x. So that means kt should be rt over x. Okay, notice that is p times 1 plus x to the 1 over x raised to the rt. And you can see what I've done there is separate this exponent into two factors. And I can see that when I multiply those together, that definitely gives me the r t over x. OK, so when I ask you, what's the limit as k approaches infinity of p times 1 plus x to the 1 over x? where that 1 plus x to the 1 over x is raised to the rt, um, you should see that the limit I really need to figure out is this limit as k goes to infinity of 1 plus x to the 1 over x. All right, now let's go back and look at what we set up here about the relationship between x and r and k. Okay, x is equal to r over k, and r is a fixed number. So this r is constant. And I'm asking you what happens when k gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you should be able to see from this equation that when k gets bigger and bigger and bigger, since it's in a denominator, that means x has to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, what that means is asking what the limit as k appro oops, asking what the limit as k approaches infinity is is the same thing as asking what's the limit as x approaches 0. And my x is going to be a positive number or positive value, so I need to be approaching 0 from the right. Okay, so if you, if you buy that, 
that asking what happens when k gets bigger is the same thing as asking what happens when x gets smaller, arbitrarily small, then this limit we're after is the same thing as limit x approaches 0 from the right of 1 plus x to the 1 over x. I'm going to leave it for you to recall and verify that that's precisely the definition that we talked about in a previous video for E. That limit is precisely equal to E. That means, back up here in our starting equation, when k gets larger and larger, our function becomes P e to the rt. Okay, notice that when t is 0, I get a equals p. And of course, p is meant to represent the initial amount. So what that looks like is a is equal to the initial amount. Let's call that a sub 0, e to the rt. Okay, doesn't that look a lot like y equals y0 e to the kt? It's exactly the same model. We've just changed a few letters. All right, so this uh, we're coming at this exponential growth from a different direction here. This was the college algebra direction. And now what you see is we have another interpretation of this exponential growth formula. This is the one in college algebra that you called the continuous exponential growth or decay function. And we also see something else from this derivation. It turns out that that k, or formerly the r that we started out with, can actually be thought of as a rate. So now when we think about this dy dt equals ky, and we say that's equivalent to y equals y0 e to the kt, we can actually give an interpretation to that k number now. That k number, or rather the absolute value of it, is thought of as the continuous exponential growth or decay rate. And obviously I'm saying absolute value because I know the sign of the k determines whether it's growth or decay. Okay, so let's do a quick example uh, similar to something you would have seen in college algebra. Uh, nothing new, pretty easy problem, and typical of what you're sort of expected to be able to do with this function at this point. So if I said the half-life of a particular substance is, let's say, 6,500 years. I might ask, how long will it take for, let's say, 100 grams of this substance to decay to, let's say, 30% of the initial amount. And this is where I would tell you to assume continuous exponential decay. Okay, remember, this process, we're describing it by a model, and so I have to make assumptions about what model does the best job, what are the limitations of that model. So we're getting into things like carbon dating here, and of course there are debates over you know, how reliable some of these methods are, which is why we call them models. And so in this case, I'm saying let's assume this is the model that describes this process, and so we're saying, once we see this statement, 
I'm to assume that the model for this decay is y equals y0 e to the kt. And I know once I figure this out that k will have to be negative because this is supposed to be a decay situation. Okay, what are they telling me? Well, they're telling me a couple of things. They're telling me the initial amount at time 0 is 100 grams. They also tell me this other thing at the beginning. They say the half-life of the substance is 6,500 years. Okay, what does that mean? It means if I started out with 100 grams, then after 6,500 years, I would have 50 grams. What would happen after another 6,500 years, so in other words, after 13,000 years, I would lose half of what I had at the end of the first 6,500 years which means I'd have 25 grams. If I want another 6,500 years, I'd have 12 and a half grams. The half-life says 6,500 years is how long it takes to lose half of what you've got. Okay, in other words, we're seeing a 50% decay over a 6,500 year period. Okay, so I can definitely say that why of 6,500 is equal to 50. Or in other words, when T is 6,500, I know that my amount has decayed to 50. All right, so if I go back to the equation, uh, this seems like the sort of problem where I need to use initial conditions like this to figure out that constant. It's not quite the same as finding out an additive constant of integration, but it's sort of in that realm. So of course we know that y is equal to 50 when our initial amount is 100. I don't know what k is, but I know the time is 6,500 years from the beginning to get me down to half of what I started with. Okay, of course if I divide both sides by 100, I have 1 half equals e to the 6,500 k. Can I solve for k? Well, that's an old algebra problem. I take the ln of both sides. I divide by 6,500. And I get k equals ln of 1 half divided by 6,500. When I put that in the calculator, I come up with approximately negative point zero 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 one oh let's say six six that takes it out to seven places uh, you notice the the magnitude of this number is quite small that's because you've reduced this to a continuous growth rate so this is trying to simulate what's happening moment by moment which means it should very be a very small percentage this is the continuous rate of decay. Okay, which means if you're going to approximate rates like this that are continuous rates of decay, uh, you're probably going to have to include quite a few decimal places because if it really is this small, there may be a number of decimal places in the beginning that are actually just zeros. Okay, what I have now is a working function. My model says that the amount of substance is the initial amount, which is 100, times e to the k, which is negative 0 0.0001066t. Now, if I wanted to answer this last part of the question about how long would it take for 100 grams to decay to 30% of the initial amount, well, the question is, what t value would get this y down to 30? So that's really another equation to solve. 30 equals 100 e to the negative 0 0.0001066t. So if I divide both sides by 100, then of course I'm going to get 0.3 equals again e to that kt value. I would take the ln of both sides, and when I take the ln on the right side, it's going to cancel out the e, 
which means T should be equal to ln of 0.3 divided by K. And when I feed that into the calculator, I get approximately 11,294 years. Okay, which makes sense because what did we say about 13,000 years? We said that was two consecutive half-lives, which would take us from 100 to 50 and then from 50 to 25. So if we want to be left with 30 grams, it should be something a little more than this 11,294. Or to say it in reverse, it should be something a little less than that 13,000 years because we haven't quite decayed at 25 grams. So at least that answer makes some sense. Let's look at one more important example of exponential growth models. This one's called Newton's Law of Cooling. And you may have seen this before in a chemistry or physics class. If not, we'll talk about it here. And we'll say that the defining equation for Newton's Law of Cooling is dt dt, and I'll explain what I mean by cap t in a minute, equals negative k times t minus t sub s. This is where t of t is the temperature, let's say, of an object in a contained environment. And let's say T sub S is the constant, let's say, steady state temperature in the surrounding region. So think. Uh, for a simple mental picture, think of a container, and let's say in that container is some medium. It could just be the medium itself, like some fluid, or there could be an object suspended. And then outside the container, uh, something is maintaining a steady state temperature, like an ambient temperature. And when I say T sub S, the S is referring to the surrounding there, so I'm talking about a steady state temperature in the region surrounding the container. Inside the container, T of T, that is this function, is describing the temperature over time. Now again, if we look at this equation and try to think about what it's describing in terms of the change in temperature of the object in the container, in the contained environment, uh, the thing I should be paying attention to is this T minus TS factor. So if I take a look at that for a minute, think about the two possibilities. T minus TS could be positive. T minus TS could be negative. Of course, if T and TS are equal, then the temperature is equalized and we don't have a very interesting situation. Let's assume there is a temperature differential there, which means we have one of these two cases. In the first case, that is T minus TS is greater than zero, that means the temperature inside the container is warmer or higher than the surrounding temperature. So we're saying this would be warmer, this would be cooler. Okay, now if this temperature is being maintained at a constant, outside the container. That means if there is a change in temperature, it's going to happen inside the container. And we know that the heat is going to flow to the region that's cooler, 
And if that's going to happen, that means the temperature inside the container should be decreasing. So dt dt should be negative. Similarly, if t minus ts is less than 0, then of course that means t is less than ts. So that means the situation is switched now. It means this is cooler inside, this is warmer outside, which means the heat flow should be from outside to inside. That means it's warming up on the inside. It means DDT should be positive. OK, notice in this formula, if T minus Oops, if T minus TS is positive, that means this is positive. And that's supposed to tell us that DT DT is negative. So in this equation, if this side, the left side of the equation is negative, and T minus TS is positive, that means this factor must be negative. That means K would be positive. Okay, think about the second case, same sort of analysis. If T minus TS is negative, but DDTT is supposed, I'm sorry, DTDT is supposed to be positive. So that means this guy is positive, but T minus TS is negative. Okay, the only way that would happen is if this was negative. So of course, if negative K is negative, that means K is positive again. So in both cases, K will be a positive number. So unlike our formula that we were talking about before, where in that general exponential growth function, the sign of the K accounts for whether the function's increasing or decreasing, the thing in this formula that really controls that is the T minus TS. And it just depends on which direction the heat's flowing. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing we did earlier for the dy dt equals ky formula. In fact, if you look at that equation and you look at Newton's law of cooling, you can see actually they have the same structure. The left side is a derivative. On the right side, there's a constant times a function of t. And that's true in Newton's law of cooling formula also. The T minus TS is a function of T. And so if we think about how we solved this equation, we can solve this equation in the same way. So if you recall, the method was to isolate the K constant on the right side. Really what we were doing is getting that y, which was the function of t, to the other side of the equation on the same side as the dy dt. So if I do that here, it would mean dividing both sides of the equation by 1 over t minus ts. Remember, ts is just a constant, leaving just minus k on the other side. I will again integrate with respect to time. Notice that on the right side here, if I were to let u equal t minus ts, then du would equal dt. And of course, if you look at the left side, that's exactly what I have. I have 1 over u dt if I think of those little dt's as canceling out. Really what I'm saying there is d big t is t prime of t dt. In any event, I end up with integral 1 over t minus t sub s d big t equals, and of course, let's just calculate the other side. That's negative kt. And now I can integrate that left side and get 
natural log of absolute value of t minus t sub s equals negative kt plus c. Uh, let's play that a little different this time, just so I'm not being so lazy with my additive constants. Let's call that a b. And now we know the trick is to raise e to both sides. When I raise e to the left side, I'll get absolute value of t minus t sub s. On the other side, I'll have e to the minus kt plus b. I know the absolute value of t minus ts really means effectively there's a plus or minus e to the minus kt e to the b on the right side of the equation. And now we know that the plus or minus and that e to the b, all of which is a constant, could be resolved into one constant that we could call, let's say, c. So c e to the minus k t equals t minus t sub s. Or in other words, if we were solving for t, it would be t equals t sub s plus c e to the minus kt. All right, let's copy that over. So t equals t sub s plus, and just to recall here, it's an arbitrary constant c is what we've called it. Okay, now what was the tact we took with the other differential equation? We tried to figure out what the c was by choosing some appropriate value for t. t equals 0 is what we used the other time. In this case, that would be t of 0. Remember, this t means t of little t. So this would be t of 0 equals t sub s plus c e to the minus k times 0, which would be e to the 0. Let's just call t of 0 t sub 0 to stand for initial temperature inside the container. That equals t sub s plus c times e to the 0. That would be c. Turns out c is t sub 0 minus t sub s. And so now if we go back to our equation and substitute this constant for c, it looks like we've got t equals t sub s plus t0 minus t sub s e to the minus kt. And when you look in different books, you'll see various different forms, different final forms of Newton's law of cooling. So when I say final forms, I mean uh, the result we get when we solve the differential equation and solve explicitly for t. Um, little variations on how this equation might be written, but this is uh, about as convenient as any form you're going to see. And so this is the final working version that we'll record for Newton's Law of Cooling. I'm not going to have you do much with this, um, a problem or two in the homework, but really this demonstration is to show you a pretty important rule from or law from physics, but more importantly, it's a second example of how to apply that integration process to uh, solve this basic equation of the form dy dt equals ky. And really, this one we just did is just a specialized version of that general form. So I think that's a good place to stop. Let me know if you have any questions.